So, but you, your background is music, right? Primarily yes. a musicologist? Uh, so musicology was my route into publishing. Okay. So uh, I was one of those kids that started playing instruments at a very, very young age. Um, and so was the musical one uh, in the family and at school, yeah. all the way through school. So it was kind of known when I started school that I, because I liked playing the piano, writing stories and drawing pictures, that I was going to, my A-levels were going to be English music and art. So yeah, nice. it was kind of all predetermined. So that was just like the end game of my education throughout. And then I would go and do a music degree or do music at uni somewhere. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to go, I'd done so much performing and, classic, and being classically trained as I, when I was growing up that I didn't really want to go to a music college where mm -hmm. the performance is or, or music school where the perform where performance is like the main Essential. focus yeah um i wanted to keep it broader than that um and so i went to cardiff university Are you um, from no i'm from surrey so yeah so i went to cardiff university uh which which was good it was quite diverse but still really academic um degree yeah. and really well respected university as well so um and even there i still kept it you you could have loaded it with sort of composition or practical stuff mm. but i still kept it quite broad and included things that were not necessarily the things that i liked doing on that there was one thing i always 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 wanted to drop um and funny enough i was back at cardiff a couple of weeks ago like talking to you know surgeons who are about to graduate and stuff oh, I but, um, that was a trip it was a bit weird actually <laughs> I saw I went into, into the large lecture theatre and I was sitting there I was thinking um no that was it the, the guy the guy the um the lecturer that had invited me along he sort of you know he said sort of, oh you must remember this 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 room and because he must have seen like a look on my face and I was like no I do I do remember this room and so I, I just never come in through that door before <laughs> going to the lecture room. but um but I sat there and I was thought how old was I when I first came into this room and I realized I was 17 when I, I must have been 17 when yeah. I went into that room I was like bloody hell so anyway um so I sat there um Talking. But it was exactly the same setup, you know, like 90% of the room was sat at the top, at the back. On the laptops. And they were like, yeah, or laptops, yeah. And then there were like three or four Human girls beings. sitting right, right at the very right. front, like <laughs> making all the notes. And I was like, it's the same. <laughs> it's exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, but um, so I went to Cardiff. Uh, but yeah, the way the course was set up was um, there was there was there were certain topics, subjects that were double modules and mm. Anyway, I would pick the ones that I wanted to do and then I would always say to myself, I'm going to avoid analysis, or just avoid analysis. But it was the one that I had to do every year, every module, it was a double module. And so I'd done it consistently throughout um, just because it was the last thing to choose. Um, and when I first started doing it, it was horrid in the, in the first year. I, was like, I didn't understand because I had a lot of difficulty with maths when I was, yeah. uh, when I was in, in school education. And it sort of brought back all those traumas. But then by the, um, by the third year, it started to get quite abstract. And whereas all the kids that had found it easy in the first year, like, were now completely lost. And I was like, what are you talking about? It's, it's <laughs> There's no yeah, so it's got, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, it was, um, it, it ended up being one of my strongest things, by, my strongest parts of my course by the time I graduated. Mm. And uh, which I was kind of, you know, um, pleasantly surprised about but then the, uh, the then I was the thing I was really surprised about when I started trying to get jobs in publishing as I knew I wanted to work in the music industry publishing appealed and within publishing media was kind of my my sort of target landing spot if you like but um, I got in touch with a, a publisher just um, very lived very close to the town I grew up in and um, just sent him a CV and at that point all I had to talk about was the the degree that I'd done. So I mentioned oh, I did a lot, you know, specialised in analysis and it just happened that this guy was working as an, a musicologist on an infringement claim at the time for the song Young at Heart. And, um, and he said, uh, I think he'd so he may have sort of hit a bit of a wall with it at the time. So he phoned me up, he said, well, can you come in for a chat? And he uh, had my CV in front and talked about analysis. And he said, well, I'm working on this case. And it was the first time I'd really heard about a musicologist mm. in terms of forensic musicology and in and in copyright disputes. So I was like, okay, so that guy says he wrote that, and those guys say he didn't, and 
It was like, look, could you come in for a day? We'll just give you all the files and you could just read them all. And then you can just write, write a report, just write down your thoughts. Yeah. Um, so, so that's what I did. And, uh, and I guess I was sort of in a kind of advisory type of capacity to him yeah. and analyzing. I said, well, if that person says that they wrote that part, I'd expect them, I, I would expect them to have said X, Y, and Z in their witness statement. Mm. And they don't. Mm. Um, you know, it doesn't doesn't read like somebody who wrote this particular part, and you can sort of tell by reading the statements and then analysing the music, which statements are more likely to be true yeah. in a way. So, looking for musical evidence to reflect those statements, in a sense, on that one particularly. Anyway, the um, um, the the guy that I was working for um, went off and it went to court, and he gave evidence, and uh, the claimant won and got you know got fifty percent of the writer's share of this song. So that was my route in, and um, that helped me get into publishing. Mm. And then that case just sort of stuck around with me for quite a while. It sort of followed me about, and um, people knew that I'd worked on it because it was on my CV. And yeah. then through that, pe various people would say, "Oh, can you, um, you know, well, I've got this concern. Can you help with this and this?" And so it, th that level of work, whilst I went, then got into publishing and into supervision and music consultancy within sync licensing and media production that um, sort of starting point mm. was still in the background all the time. And it sort of just consistently kept going um, until when I got to the point where I started my own business, uh, I was still in touch with the person that had given me that first job. Um, and I just said, well, why don't we, I, I, I said, are you still doing that kind of work? He said, yeah, but for f film companies and people that generally know that I do it. I said, well, I'm now, Doing it, for, yeah, for you know, friends of friends and unsigned artists who are having you know, horrible, horrible kind of um, situations yeah, where yeah. someone really established has heard an unsigned artist thing played on a regional radio station and then sent his lawyers after him because it sounds a bit like, you know, just helping people out for free yeah, on that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But also working with ad agencies as well, and uh, said, so look, let's just let's put it, put our names together as a, a joint service. Mm. So we did that in 2013 as Chandler and Sadell. Yeah. And, uh, and we've worked on, I think we're up to about 50 matters now that we've been involved in. And there's, it's quite busy at the moment. Um, in fact, it's sort of consistently got busier, but there's probably up to about um, over at least half a dozen things that we're across that are sort of ongoing. If you like, so all, all um, like litigation, or they are all contentious. That, ah. The ones that we're on at the moment are all contentious. We have done non-contentious stuff. Yeah. Um, we've done. Um, we call it like a copyright compliance type of process, uh, almost like a due diligence. And mm. we've done that for things which are more predominantly American-based commissions for American networks, where there seems to be this is written into part of the deliverables for the produ for the production company, so that they need to have had some kind of independent objective um opinion if yeah. you like and yeah. guidance on the music and we've done that for you know entire series we did one mostly for kids shows actually but got lots of music in and they've had a composer. so we did one a couple of series for a little cartoon um where they just had a bit of music um but it was all it was all scored and eventually it became the same score you know in later episodes and then we did one for a, a tv show that was 50 episodes and uh, it's not out. Yeah, I think it's out at the end of this year. Okay. But a kids, kids show, um, and the music. The production company was in the UK. It was quite international. The production company in the UK. Um, I think they were recording the music in Canada. Um, uh, but it was no, there was a there was a song, a, a, an original song in every episode, at least one in every episode. Oh, so, God. so they wanted us, you know, sort of like a due diligence process and. And it was, it was a really useful process because essentially what we're doing is it, difficult because it's a slightly new way of working, but with people being so um, uh, kind of risk conscious, if you like, at the moment, and with so many high profile lawsuits going on, um, you sort of have to kind of, if, if we hear something in the music where we're looking for common pitfalls or we might even be looking for, um, you know, just if it sounds, um, we're still looking for objective similarity, mm -hmm. but in a sense, it's difficult because our brief is listen to this music and tell us if you think it and compare it with all the music in the world. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So in a sense, what we were doing is 
we're pri providing very short form reports whereby we've listened to it and we'll look at the way that it's put together, briefly summarize that, uh, identify certain generic compositional techniques that have been used, mm -hmm. um, and then find prior arts that share, you know, some or all of those features yeah. and look for something that is about it that is, uh, you know, that we'll look at, analyze it and look at it at, as in terms of what's protectable and what isn't protectable about that composition. So if we don't have any concerns, and it's, it can't ever be a guarantee that a third party won't hear it and go, oh, that sounds like such and such, because yeah. you, can't, you can't mitigate against no. that. Um, but it can be, uh, if, if the producers then did get a claim from a third party, they can go, well, no, actually, we did this process. Here's our report. And it may even be a first point of, ref of kind of rebuttal, if yeah. you like, yeah, yeah, for yeah. those kind of claims. Go, well, actually, no, the thing that you're mentioning is it, that we've infringed. Actually, here are some examples that our musicologists gave us where we share those with other prior arts and those predate yours. So, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. but then at the same time, I would say at least um, there was still, out of 50 episodes, there was still probably 20 that we sent back and said, we think you should... Um, you, you know, and we're, and we're actually identifying other songs saying, and that could cause some friction, obviously, with the composers, because they think then we're, what we're saying is... They've copied someone. Yeah, yeah, it comes across, it, it has to be carefully kind of um, expressed, because it could come across as you're saying that I sat there and deliberately... So we were getting responses kind of, well, I've never even heard of that. How can I have copied it? I've never even heard of that. It doesn't matter. Yeah, and we were going, but we're not suggesting that you have. Yeah. We're looking for objective similarity yeah. and we're here to and trying to anticipate what might have occur totally. and to head that off before it happens. So, totally. it, so it, it, it was a bit of... A, on that one particularly, it was a, it, we had to tread carefully at the beginning because there was some pushback. And, uh, and, and then we sort of said, well, hang on a minute, you've brought us in to, to do this, so it seems strange to push back. Yeah, <laughs> when we're just trying to give you what the answer actually is, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, but it, it all went really well. So, but so we've done non-consensual stuff as well, sort of, I guess, um, it's for infringement avoidance. Mm -hmm. And then there are, we have also been asked, which is where we draw the line, um, because it's kind of it's non it's non contentious work, but it's um, but it's it, but it's contentious practice if you like. Because we have been asked on occasion by um, not for film, but in in other media, yeah. um, where we've been contacted by someone. So well, we wanted to use this song, and we couldn't afford it, so we decided to get someone to write something that's like it. And but now you know now our, now we're concerned that it's like too similar. And we're like, well, use something else, yeah, <laughs> or yeah, pay for yeah. the one, you know. Um, so we get asked, and we, and we say, well, look, if you want us to give a a, a view, then yeah. we can give you a view between two pieces of music. But what we're not going to do is sit here and tell you and what to change and how to change it because that's really we're not going to sort of facilitate. Um, Getting as close as you can, you know. To the line. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, that goes against the purpose, right? Yeah, yeah. It's completely un. Well, you know, it, it's unethical in, yeah. in our view, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, and also um, we don't want we don't want to be known for doing that yeah. um, because also it's a small industry and it will get back to it will go back to it circles back to rights holders. Rights no, holders totally. find out what you know what what's going on because then when their writers phone up and go, "Have you seen that?" thing on TV that sounds just like my song and they phone up a musicologist and go, can you give us a view? And we go, we can't because we, 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 we worked with the one that did it. <laughs> They'll go, oh, okay. <laughs> right. that's why it sounds so similar. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, it's just, um, uh, yes, yeah, not, it's not a way of working that we yeah. will get into. That, so then that firm you work with is separate from your music. Uh, sync licensing company. Yeah, so that it, the musicology service is called Chandler and Sedell. Yeah. So there's me, Christian Stowe, and my colleague, Ivan Chandler. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, it sort of ticks along on its own. It's a small area of the industry. People know that we do it, and we, we don't really have to push it. We, pushed, we started it in 2013. And most of the stuff's inbound. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And also you know, there's a limit to how much you can take on with that stuff at once as, yeah, as well. Totally. I'd say we're probably pretty 
close to our capacity That's with that type of work at the moment. Yeah. And so then the rest of the stuff you drive is that you kind of your day to day stuff is consulting on music sync licensing. Yeah, so my music supervision consultancy is called Sync Music, mm -hmm. really original name that I <laughs> fucking came up with in 2008. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, um, uh, I mean, it's, the good thing about both of them is they're both really client focused. Yeah. And they're about the client's needs, as in the production company needs, the, the, you know, the, the audio visual, the media creator. So um, Sync Music essentially operates like a, a bolt on music department. And so there are um, production companies that Sync Music, is, it serves that purpose where they have no internal music department you know, in-house, mm. um, and they might, it would be from music consultancy to full-on music supervision, and within that it will be source music as in pre-existing music, or it will be dealing with composers as well. More often than not, it's, um, or in the last couple of years, it's been more about source music than it has been about composers. Um, but that's just the nature of the work. So, um, Is that sourcing music from other artists and then paying the fees to be able to... Yeah, so it? sourcing pre-existing music. Uh, well, fully, like, also, um, it's not beyond just sourcing music and then negotiating license deals. Um, it's also knowing various mechanisms that are available for clearing music. Mm. Um, there's a huge, as you can imagine, a, a large amount of copyright knowledge has to support. It's no, good, it's no good just going to a client going, I'm a music supervisor, I like music. I can hear music. I could probably choose music for you yeah. because that's not what most of the job is. Yeah. Most of the job is then knowing how to clear that. And, yeah. and we've inherited and I have inherited um, from some clients um, jobs uh, that have gone wrong with, with, with other people. Well, people that were brought in as music supervisors, but probably weren't really music supervisors. And I feel quite um, a lot of sympathy for the clients because how can they differentiate between one person saying I'm a music supervisor and, and, the other. and another, yeah. you know? Um, so, um, yeah, so we, yeah, we'll source music. Um, if it's TV, there might be different mechanisms available for clearing that music. Yeah. Um, it's also budget casting, increasingly more involved in development work as well um, to get accurate budgets in place. Yeah. Um, it's maintaining those kind of um, relationships with with rights holders on behalf of uh, production company as, as well. Like right? gotcha. if you're if you're a production company and you don't have a lot of relationships in the music industry, you want your music supervisor to have and know all those key points. So I've probably got over a hundred labels and publishers in terms of you know on my contacts list yeah, yeah, although yeah. a lot of the work goes through a lot of the same companies being most imagine. of the music in the world is yeah. owned by two companies yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you have any approaches so would, would you say that's kind of the main um the main not shortcut but the main um insight you have in terms of how to source music without giving it an arm and a leg is to have relationships with the rights holders uh the relationship with the rights holders i find is most um of most value because they're quite they're quite personal relationships mm. um, you deal with a lot of the points of contact so you you don't beat around the bush really you just you know you cut straight to the the core of it and uh, and just go look this is what they're thinking this is what they want what do you reckon how quickly and you know what are the logistics here and you just have an honest conversation yeah more or less right off the bat with the um, with with the main ones um, it, it, I still find actually every now and then you you have to approach um, someone that you haven't dealt with before. It might be quite a, an obscure, you know, it might be a small independent, for example. Yeah. Um, um, and it, it is it's interesting to see people's different approaches. But it's, I guess it just depends how you deal with people. If you if people are clear that you're being straight down the line with them and just going look and you're laying out the facts of a situation, then you can bring people on board. Yeah. But one of the one thing I did observe about it recently is um, it's quite interesting because you've got, sometimes you might have a lot of different um, shareholders in a piece of music or within a range of rights that exist with one piece of music. Um, and you are trying to bring everybody in line with each other, but you're, and the expectations may be way off sometimes. But most of the time, you, you, and you're trying to de deal with those negotiations, but you're also doing it by email. Yeah. So your use of language is so important, Absolutely. especially when you think how an email can be 
misinterpreted or intonation like you know yeah. so um so it can be um it, yeah it can uh, it, it can be a challenge from that point of view like just deciding exactly how to draft it requires a certain amount of skill i think in in terms of doing that um, and but then also at the same time knowing when to pick up the phone as well yeah. knowing when a phone call is going to be more effective than a, absolutely than a, than a 2 a.m email yeah exactly yeah so um but it's you know it's really good and uh, what i like most about that is um is the fact that you know sync music as a bolt-on um music department in a sense um is there to fully support the the production company, if it's whether it's an ad agency mm. or an independent mm. producer or a, or a bigger production company, um, one of um, our main clients is a is a is a large. Um, they do loads of factual output, and then you know they're massive, but they they don't have any internal music resource either. So mm. we're just sort of with the on call music consultants for them across, you know, across all their production um, managers. So yeah. and it's so so it's um, no, it's really good, and it's just. It's just that, that it's that same scenario where someone phones you up in a bit of a panic because music can be quite a complicated area. And, and I've, often left is kind of like, the, like oh, we can yeah. have a budget on music, we'll, we'll think about it later. Yeah, you know? and often passed down the line to the production the assistant. And you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. no. <laughs> no, but the amount of times you get called by a production assistant who's been left to, you know, you clear can clear the, the archive. And, a, and there's a production assistant, like, just kind of junior role. And I'm, I'm going, this is... This is this was a conversation I had just this week with yeah. a client, and um, I was going. I, I, I feel for those guys. So it's a bit of an unfair expectation to just to kind of let the production assistant try and ho- hoover it up, yeah. you know, on the fly kind of thing. Because it's uh, it, it's 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 a role. Yeah. It's something, you know, and it's a whole. It's a, the landscape of rights. It's something that needs to be um, given proper consideration yeah. to. But so if you if you get clients that come to you and they do ask you to say they've sourced music themselves and they ask you to clear rights on it. What are the first steps that you take? Do you just reach out to your network? Um, yeah, so uh, um, first thing I will do is you look at you know how they're using it, what they're using, are they using, you know, what rights they need. Mm. Um, performer master, perf- you know, uh, performer rights, you know, master of publishing. Um, and then uh, my go-to will be the publishers. If you if you're trying to get a quick answer on something, look up the publishers first because you can't for using a recording or something. You, can't, you still need the publishers. So, um, I would always tackle publishers first. If there's a number of writers and they, maybe they've all got different publishing deals, I would uh, go to the the major stakeholder first, um, especially if it's a publisher that I know and I usually know the point of contact to go to. Um, but yeah, then it's just really, um, it, unless it's like a, a, a real urgent last minute thing, if it's just like a conventional kind of request, I'll um, get all the information I need f- from, I anticipate all the questions that I'm going to be asked by the rights holders, just to minimise the amount of to and fro there is, yeah, and just try and succinctly draft everything, um, essentially draft the deal memo on behalf of the, uh, on behalf of my client, and then just put that across to um, to to the rights holder, mm. um, and just try and deal with it really efficiently. If you lay all the information out really clearly, then um, and and also fact check as well. Never leave anything. Like ask the questions you need to ask at the beginning. Don't leave don't leave any aspects like w- with a question mark over yeah, it. And just yeah, kind of yeah. you know what because also if you're looking at rights holders in the UK, but you want to clear something worldwide, the amount of times that um, you sort of get quite far down a process. And then a and then then a rights holder will go. Oh, by the way, we only we don't actually control this in America, or we don't actually have the rights in these territories. And you just go, uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So now you just sort of learn to build in those questions yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. head off set, you know situations repeatedly. So it's like, do you do you control this? How much and where? Yeah. You know, because the information I have is this and. Um, you know, just trying to get them to be forthcoming. But you know, also, I, I understand that you're dealing with people who have got a ton of these things going across their desk, yeah, and, and the majority of which probably won't happen for them either. Yeah. So, 
Um, so, uh, but but yeah, and then just be as agreeable as possible. Yeah. <laughs> by not by which I don't mean agree to all the terms that come back. I'm just saying be nice. Yeah. Personable, yeah. <laughs> don't be an asshole. Yeah, yeah, don't be an asshole. <laughs> so for films that are operating around, say, like independent budgets, uh, not my, maybe between micro budget and low budget, so 50k to anywhere from like 100k. Yeah. How would you recommend they go about? sourcing and clearing rights for music would you recommend getting a consultancy because if the fee the fees might be a little too high for those productions yeah how what, what kind of avenues would you recommend um <clears throat> i think even on for even for micro budget and low budget um productions it's still worth having a music specialist a music rights specialist involved because your music rights specialist will be able to look at the budget that you have for music and should have the knowledge and the contacts and the um, resources um, to get the most out of your budget, even though it's small. Mm. Um, and you know, I had this. Uh, I mean, that's part of the part of the role. That's part of, in my view, that's part of the job is to capture good value for your client on their budget. Don't just kind of go, oh, well, you've got that. Let's spend it all on. It's when you want to get, and also look at what their requirements are. So there was an independent film that was low budget, it wasn't necessarily micro budget, but worked on um, in the last couple of years. And <clears throat> they came to us quite late in the day, by which time they didn't have a huge amount because they were borrowing out of the music pot. And gotcha. this, you know, is getting smaller and smaller. I think they only had about 12 grand for music. Yeah. Um, and I look, and and they had music in every single scene of this feature film, every scene, <clears throat> and um, and they tempt with lots of really famous music, <laughs> um, which is fine. It's just you know for temping, but um, she so looked at it, and uh, and the producer was a bit concerned at this point, and said, okay, well look, first of all, you don't need famous music in every one of these. You know, you need to choose which areas of this film, of the film that require. A famous piece of music so that we have budget for that and then we'll negotiate as good a deal as we can possibly get for you at that point as well you also put it's almost a sales pitch in some ways to rights holders without it wanting without it coming across as a sales pitch yeah. um but a positive framing of the production um then also knowing well look you've got all of these kind of um uh, background uses of music in bars well we know that we can get you a, a five grand uh, MCPS production music license, which will give you unlimited use. So mm -hmm. let's put 5K in that, because then that deals with 90% of your music, yeah. <laughs> your in scene uses of music straight away. And they were like, okay. And I said, and then, and then, and then knowing that the produce, the director might be a, because there's a bit, of, there's still even now a bit of a stigma to production music. Mm. And I said, but don't worry about that, because when I mentioned it to them, I could see them kind of go, yeah, really? And I said, but don't worry, because we're also going to use our, um, our knowledge and relationships. We'll go and find you music that isn't yet production music, yeah. and we'll make it, we'll, we'll make it production music. We'll go and find independent bands and artists, and, uh, and we'll make their music production music for you, so it can go under this license. Yeah. Um, so we did that, and we went and found a couple of artists that um, the director loved. One of which I put forward for like just for one scene, and he liked this guy so much he put ten of his tracks Whoa. in the film. One of them twice, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it did, it he practically really? became a featured artist, and, and it all went under this license, you know. So all went under the MPS license. MCPS, yeah, MCPS went under the MCPS license. MCPS license. So we wow. made sure that that music then became production music, so that it could go under that license. Um, uh, and then it will exist as production music and it will be exploited in other productions as production music as well. Um, so it's, it's a win-win for, for the writer as well. Um, and they know they've signed it as production music, but it's immediately been used in something. Yeah. Um, and then we looked at it and they had these kind of um, uh, sort of atmospheric passages in this stuff. And I said, well, you, you realise you're going to need a score. And they were like, yeah, we obviously don't have... And I said, but don't worry. I said, I know... I know a composer that you know is talented, but needs. He's been sort of ghostwriting in a sense on um, with with established composers yeah. on um, on on bigger broad on bigger bigger shows. But he's looking for credits in his own right. Um, so it's knowing. It's, it's just having contacts and knowing what people's agendas are yeah. and what they're trying to achieve, and just marrying up needs with skills and 
and matching budget and fee level expectation. Yeah. And we managed to get managed to get score um, with synth and live instruments because the composer got really carried away and started bringing in you know other musicians from his university oh, and wow. so it got like a live opera singer at one point and cellist and you know bringing in live so got really good um original soundtrack we thought it was going to just be a few minutes worth it ended up being 20 minutes of score in this film we've got almost wall-to-wall -wall music throughout the whole yeah, thing yeah, yeah. for around about 12 grand that. you know Fancy. and it all it all just nicely like married yeah. up so yeah, yeah. um so it's just it's it's knowing how to stretch those things out, um, optimize the budget, get the best value, mitigate all risk, so everything is sewn up nicely, mm. but also match the creative, mm. um, and uh, yeah, everyone went away pretty pleased. So it was, it was good all around. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay, before we wrap, I know we're running short on time. Mm. Um, I think that's especially the independent band point is an incredible one for. If you're an indie film trying to look for a way to maximize your budget, you can use independent music. Yeah. Um, is there anything you see independent filmmakers consistently doing wrong or making mistakes that you think would be an easy fix if there was just a little bit more awareness before they? <clears throat> a massive part of the role of, of as a music supervisor is managing people's expectations, um, and also um, factoring in the the stuff you know they don't know. For example, the time it takes to get a response. Um, so walking them through it so that their expectations are realistic, but then also knowing when a no is a no and don't, you know, go and f try and find, don't try and, don't try and circumvent the rights holder because you go, well, that famous person wrote this song, so I'll just go straight to them. Because they may well, they may well be enthusiastic about your film, but they also have signed away their rights. They don't own that anymore. Yeah. They've signed it to the rights holder. So um, I would say don't get locked jaw about specific songs. There is more than one song in the world that will work for your scene. <laughs> um, Tempest production music can work up if yeah. you don't want to put, you know, load it with really high value music and then, and then you feel like you're Stepping down. Depriving yourself by stepping back. Um, but also be open-minded and also let know if, you're, if your music supervisor says it's, it's, it's a hard no on something, know when to let go and move on. Because that actually is probably one of the hardest uh, scenarios to deal with where you're, you know, you're on a production which you know is running out of time and, and, you've, and you know you've exhausted everything and you, you know that this you know, the, the, a request is not going to happen, yeah. but then the, your client refuses to acknowledge that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, but, and also bu budget enough if you can <laughs> for music, the, there's a, the music industry thinks there's a rule of thumb in the film industry that 10% of your budget is going to be, is going to be music, Hysterical. which is why they will ask you when you're clearing a piece of music, what is your production budget? And they'll look, then they'll say, and how many you know other songs are in the film, and then they'll do a reverse calculation yeah. to base their quote on, and they'll come back with something, and you'll laugh and go, "That's not. <laughs> I know what you're doing. It's you not can't. You're not doing that." And then you'll tell you know your client will go, "Why do they want to know a whole production budget?" And you'll say, "Because they're reverse calculating how much they think you've allocated per song." And they were like, "But we didn't allocate anything." And I was like, "I know. <laughs> I know. I'm in the middle of yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, we've just scraped this together for other budgets." <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I don't know if there were specific answers in that, but yeah, those... They definitely were. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet, should call it Sweet. Thank cool. you. Thanks. Yeah, no problems. Saturday as well, I really appreciate it.